Okay, you can start.
Um, in Linux version 3.4, we had uh, some UFS uh, universal flash storage uh, drivers were added to the kernel, and you can look at the documentation directory for those. Um, also, a common clock framework uh, unified the handling of subsystems and clocks. Is for a long time the ARM uh, ARM has had kind of a lot of uh, each each board or platform is having the clock it's kind of its own way, and this uh, unifies that. Also, something that went in in 3.4 was something called HSI, High Speed Synchronous Serial Interface. This is used for communication between the CPU and cellular modem engines, so off-board off or off-chip um, uh, engines. Uh, so we're seeing some more support in the kernel for uh, working with uh, external processors. Um, also, in 3.4, uh, uh, we have the DMA buffer sharing API, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when I talk about graphics. That's uh, one of the big issues in graphics these days is how are buffer shared, buffers shared between uh, different uh, subsystems. And then finally, the remote proc subsystem. Uh, and again, this is another, uh, another mechanism that allows for control of other CPUs through shared memory. So um, there's something called RP message, and that's a mechanism for communicating with other CPUs, specifically for CPUs running on Linux. And so we're starting, well, we've been seeing this for years and years. We see a lot of um, SOCs that have multiple cores on them, and often, uh, you know, a, a DSP or even a Cortex M0 or M3 or something. Um, uh, but something that's not running Linux. And uh, so these, these are some facilities in the kernel uh, to talk to those other uh, boards and, or other chips. Uh, well, actually, on chip, other, other CPUs. Um, in Linux kernel version 3.5, we had uh, some kernel log rework. Uh, there was a new structured print gate uh, with tags. We had support for writing NFC drivers, uh, near field communication drivers. Also, some of the Android RAM console work was, was integrated uh, uh, into RAM Oops and PStore. Uh, there were some user space probes um, and then auto sleep. Um, so, user space probes is kind of a, a debugging mechanism uh, similar to K probes but for uh, inserting uh, code into user space. Uh, and then auto sleep was uh, the Android wake locks that made its way in. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later also. In, uh, in version Linux, uh, Linux version 3.6, uh, we saw the RAM console functionality uh, was added into PStore, uh, it would, where that work continued from 3.5. Um, also, uh, for those in the automotive area, looking using the CAN protocol, there was CANFD support. Uh, that's uh, the CAN protocol, but with flexible data rate. That's, a, that's an improvement, a new uh, a new addition to the CAN protocol. Um, also, an interesting thing uh, was LED one-shot mode, and this is a SysFS interface uh, that allows you to control uh, to just with a couple of uh, um, um, settings in SysFS. You can you can set up uh, a, a very easily uh, control over LEDs. Uh, this could also be applied to GPIOs in, in some situations when the GPIOs have been kind of configured into the kernel using the LED subsystem. But uh, this is pretty nice. Uh, uh, it allows the kernel to kind of handle uh, LED events without additional uh, user space programming. Um, and then suspend to both. Um, and this is a, a method of suspending that creates an image both in RAM and on disk. And so, so what this does is that uh, it creates kind of a snapshot. Um, if the power, if there's enough battery left in the device, um, when the user goes to restore it, um, then uh, then it, the image will come from RAM, that RAM snapshot. But if the power dies, the disk image can be can be used to resume. That shouldn't be a power dies during suspended. Yeah, I guess that's correct. Um, so that's kind of an interesting feature that allows you to have kind of the benefits of both 
things. You can have quick wake up if the power hasn't died, uh, but you have kind of guaranteed uh, image uh, wake up if the power did, for some reason, die while, while the machine was asleep. In Linux version 3.7, uh, we actually saw the first uh, instances of ARM multi-platform support. So this was the first kernel where I believe you could actually use a single ARM image to boot on multiple platforms. Uh, this is something that uh, single, kind of single image is what they also call this. Uh, people have been working on it for quite a long time, um, and uh, it should it. I'm not that excited about this for the uh, for the. Um, kind of deeply embedded space where you want to have a custom kernel, but uh, there are some configurations, especially uh, when you start seeing kind of tablets or other devices used uh, using more kind of uh, common distributions, uh, it makes sense to have like a distribution vendor create a single kernel that can run on multiple devices. Uh, so pretty interesting. And that kind of combines with device tree to, to support that feature. Also in Linux version 3.7, uh, we saw the, the ARM 64-bit support. Um, uh, it's called ARCH64 uh, in most of the ARM literature. Um, but uh, uh, that this support is now in there, and, and uh, people can now start using uh, the kernel on the, that new uh, CPU. Uh, also, I thought it was very interesting the crypto cryptographically signed kernel modules. So it's now possible uh, for the kernel to do to have a stored key um, and uh, to check that uh, the signature on a module uh, before it loads it. Uh, so this is actually pretty important from a security standpoint. And uh, this is something that we wanted to get into the kernel for quite a long time. I can remember way back. Uh, uh, quite a long time ago, um, probably uh, six or seven years ago, people were working on this same feature, and it's nice to see it, uh, a form of it finally get get in. Um, and then uh, something I thought was interesting, perf trace, um, and it's uh, a feature that's a kind of an alternative to strace. Over time, F trace has built up a, a large number of um, different trace events and perf trace is a is a mechanism to try and uh, essentially uh, work as an alternative to s trace. Um, and so s trace is focused on uh, well, S, the original s trace uses uh, the p trace system call or yeah, the p trace mechanism in the kernel and trace is just system call system calls. What perf trace does is allows you to trace the system calls, but at the same time you can add to that other kernel events that might be related to those. Uh, one of the things I really like to do is uh, intermingle uh, both the syscalls and the um, page faults uh, because I think it's really interesting to see when page faults are occurring relative to the different syscalls that a program is making. And so this perf trace allows you to do things like that that are very useful for analyzing the system. Um, also in Linux 3.7 we saw some uh, runtime power management for audio. Um, and I think this came from the Wolfson, uh, some of the Wolfson audio uh, work. Uh, they've been doing quite a bit of uh, stuff and uh, being able to control uh, aspects of the audio uh, runtime power management should help overall with, uh, with the uh, longevity of uh, embedded systems. Uh, and then, uh, kind of interesting, the kernel doc system can now output uh, the kernel documentation in HTML5 format. Um, and so that's that's kind of nice. Uh, I think one of the big pieces of news in Linux version 3.8 is uh, I think a lot of people are very interested in F2FS, the Flash-friendly file system. Um, and I I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that later. Uh, but there's the the new thermal governor system in the kernel. Uh, there's also uh, so the thermal governor system subsystem that that allows you uh, for the kernel to to recognize thermal events, which is uh, overheating uh, of the CPU, and and uh, to do appropriate things, uh, frequent uh, adjust the frequency or, or turn off components. 
uh, very similar to power management, but uh, related to heat and not just power consumption. Uh, also, uh, in 3.8, there's a, a new feature, uh, memory control group support for accounting for criminal memory usage. Uh, so this is actually pretty neat. Uh, there's the memory control system, uh, memory controller system uh, is a control group that uh, has allowed you to track user space uh, memory utilization, uh, but there's now actually some additional instrumentation to track the in-kernel memory usage, so things like the stack and the slab usage uh, for a process. So you can see how much kernel memory is being used uh, by uh, any process, uh, a single process or a group of processes that are in a control group. Uh, this is targeted primarily at the desktop space right now in order to um, allow uh, for uh, control over things like fork bombs but uh, I think this is going to be really useful in Embedded uh, because you can fine-tune, uh, if you have this extra information and instrumentation, you can fine-tune uh, your kernel much more effectively and uh, use the information on a per-process basis to find out uh, exactly who's using memory and uh, the kernel memory and how to improve that. And then finally, uh, CPU idle support uh, for Big Little. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of work been going on relative to big dot little in the kernel, um, the in kernel switcher, uh, and uh, so this allows for um, doing managing the CPU idle of the different cores, heterogeneous cores in uh, in. Uh, uh, well, currently on an ARM processor, but it, the same technology will apply to, uh, to other, other processors that are in heterogeneous configurations. Um, and we just had the merge window for Linux version 3.9. So we have a little bit of an idea, uh, actually a pretty good idea, of what will be in 3.9. We're on 3.9 RC1 right now. Uh, some of the interesting things uh, not a huge number of things so far. I think I may be able to find some more um, as it as uh, we get more information about it. But one thing that caught my eye was ftrace snapshots. And this is the ability to grab a snapshot of a running trace without stopping. I think this is a, a very similar to a feature that LTTNG has had for, uh, for some time. Uh, and uh, so you can actually grab the data and, and uh, kind of snapshot in time and, and uh, save it off. That's pretty useful um, <clears throat> for certain types of debugging. Also, uh, the very, this is the very first time I've seen this, and although it's on PowerPC and it's on a fairly new processor, I think in the future we're gonna see more uses of transactional memory. Uh, and so we, we actually see the very first support for transactional memory. There's a set of PowerPC instructions uh, for handling transactional memory, most of the most of the this is currently targeted at user space apps, and this, so this is kernel support for support for user space applications that are using transactional memory. But um, I think that uh, uh, transactional memory, you know, currently is um, well, it's a fairly new CPU feature, but I think its usage is going to be expand in the future as a mechanism for supporting. Uh, SMP systems in uh, kind of a more transparent way, uh, easier to program for uh, than our current method that we use locking and set of and stuff. Um, and then just kind of an interesting thing, config experimental uh, is is now currently defaulted to yes. It has been, it was defaulted to no for the longest time, but all kinds of things depend on it. Uh, in the kernel configuration. And uh, so the first step is to make it default to Y, uh, and actually the plan is to remove it from the kernel. So all the stuff that uh, the people were saying it, it really didn't have uh, much use, it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't actually communicating any information or guarding the system from, from weird things because everybody ignored it. Uh, but anyway, so it's gonna get removed and this is the first step. So a couple of things to watch. 
at least um, for, this is kind of my opinion of things to watch. I think we're going to continue to see Android features integrated into the kernel. Uh, the two that are really close to, to getting in, I think, are volatile ranges and the ARM FIQ stuff. I'll talk about both of those a little bit later. Uh, we're seeing a lot of work on Big Dot Little. Lenaro is spending a lot of time uh, working on that. And then uh, also we have uh, SOC, SOC support for ARM. Uh, just the big refactoring that's been going on with the device tree and the single image stuff. Uh, that continues to, to be a hot topic. Uh, there were several um, maintainers, ARM maintainers, at uh, Embedded Linux Conference talking about uh, you know, with the new style, how to how to uh, put your board support package up upstream with the kind of the new refactoring rules that they have. So, so those are kind of some kind of areas to watch. So that's that's kind of what's gone on in the last year in the kernel. And I probably missed some really important stuff. I know there there was some software suspend stuff. I hesitated. I didn't know whether to include it, um, but. Uh, but it looked like it was kind of more desktop-y stuff. So now I'd like to kind of go through, uh, instead of by kernel version, go through technology areas and talk about uh, different different technology areas, what's been going on. And a lot of this material is pretty pretty new um, based on stuff that I heard at uh, Embedded Linux Conference. So I hope I'm not, uh, I know that there's a, a talk later today uh, on, uh, on the Embedded Linux conference, so I hope I'm not going to uh, ruin the surprise for any of the things I talk about. Um, but so in the area of boot up time, I think one of the areas that, uh, one of the technologies that we're seeing uh, start to get used quite a bit more is System D. Uh, so System D is a new initialization mechanism that starts services and demons on demand. Um, and Angstrom uses System D. Uh, there's actually a really good article here by uh, Matt Ma Massey uh, talking about how Angstrom is using System D um, in the desktop space. So, so this is a this is a new system uh, that we have not you really used that much in embedded. It's got quite a bit of overhead, and so uh, people either love System D or hate it or both, <laughs> and uh, and it's because it's different. It uh, you do have to make some changes. Um, I still think that there are a lot of places where kind of a traditional, either an RC-based init makes sense, or Android has its own init initialization system with a lot of kind of built-in uh, assumptions about the system. Um, but uh, it, as uh, desktop Linux systems move to System D, I think we're going to start to see some of the uh, software kind of integrated into this system. It also includes a journaling system. Uh, before we start to use it in a wide scale way, it would be nice to get some boot time and size numbers to be able to evaluate this. The last time I looked, System D was pretty large, um, and so uh, I, I, I currently would hesitate to use it in, uh, in, in one of uh, Sony's products until I got some more information about it. But it is it does it is pretty effective at uh, at delaying uh, or deferring boot costs until later in the system startup. Um, in the area of graphics, there was a big announcement recently uh, by Ubuntu about a new display server that they're doing called Mirror, um, and uh, so they're actually going to use it to replace X um, and use it across multiple form factors. Uh, so. Uh, the successor to X that's being pushed by a lot of other um, groups is Wayland. Uh, so this was kind of a surprise to me. I didn't see this one coming. Uh, but the interesting thing about it, the kind of the neat thing, is that it leverages Android GPU drivers. I think Wayland has a capability to do that as well. But uh, Ubuntu says this is going to re replace X um, you know, across the board, so that means it'll be showing up in tablets and phones and other embedded devices. And so, uh, there's on H Online there. There's this link here. You can kind of see some of the attributes of it and what uh, what uh, Canonical has has talked about for that. So that's 
Uh, it's not often you see a brand new uh, display server announced, so that's pretty, pretty big news. Um, the other thing that uh, is going on in graphics, and there was another uh, Birds of a Feather session at ELC on this, is uh, about unifying uh, the approach to buffer management. So Android has DevION, um, and the main line has something called the CMA, Contiguous Memory Allocator, and uh, something related to that called DMA buffer, buff, which is for passing around uh, buffers inside the kernel and allowing different subsystems to share those and, and pass data around. Um, and there's a lot of work to try and integrate those two approaches so there can be a single unified uh, memory management layer for all these different systems. And uh, so there were people discussing that at ELC and hopefully making progress. Um, in the area of file systems, I think the biggest news recently is F2FS, which is Samsung's new flash-friendly file system. And uh, usually when I talk about something that's pretty new, it's not super new. I mean, Samsung first kind of announced it in the summer, and but they were pretty quick about getting it mainlined. So they sent uh, some of their patches in, and there was a lot of discussion in October, November, which allowed it to get it into Linux next, and it got mainlined in Linux version 3.8. So it's actually in the kernel tree now. Um, and uh, it's kind of, uh, it, there's a lot of technical details to it. Uh, there's some really good articles uh, describing it, and presentations. I put together a, an eLinux page about it. Uh, you can go around, go there and, and look at some of the links there. Uh, some of the weird, it, it does some, it's, it's very highly optimized for kind of some specific things that are unique to to modern uh, FTL, uh, EMMC, and SD, SDD drives or parts. Uh, it does, one of the things that's interesting, it does uh, actually looks at the pattern of data writes and, and separates the data into hot data versus cold data, uh, things that change frequently versus things that don't change frequently, and, and does a separation there. But, um, but it's very interesting, and, and for um, some of the devices that they've measured, it's getting up to about 20% performance improvement on certain operations. So that's that's pretty impressive. Um, anyway, so that's that's a new area thing to look at in file systems. Um, so the CE work group also has uh, is just nearing completion of a project to analyze file system performance on EMMC, and so I'll talk about that when I get to the CE work group projects. Uh, in terms of power management, the big news was auto sleep. Uh, and this is not super news. This was super recent. Uh, this was mainlined in version 3.5. This is basically auto uh, wake locks uh, after after much uh, much work. Uh, the wake lock features uh, that uh, Google was in, uh, kind of created for Android has made it in, in some form into the kernel. Um, I don't know, actually know the status of Android adopting these, but the, the facilities are there now, so um, so there was a lot, of, a lot of work getting that done. The other thing that's interesting is uh, power-aware scheduling. So the kernel, uh, for a long time, had a little bit of power awareness in the scheduler but it was removed a couple of versions ago, and, and uh, there have been proposals to add some technology back, um, and actually some code hit mainline on this, uh, so that the scheduling can be can be uh, made aware of uh, power requirements, uh, can be integrated into the decision making for scheduling applications. Uh, and then, you know, I always think I always think that this is the year that no one, that everyone's going to stop caring about size. <laughs> but, but it turns out that there was actually a lot of stuff going on this year in uh, terms of size. So there's a Ezekiel Garcia's Trace Analyze kernel memory analysis, and he actually had a, a talk on this. I'll, I'll talk about this later because this was based on a CE workgroup project uh, and had some good results. The other thing in the area, so this was just analysis of dynamic memory usage in the kernel. Another thing uh, that we that we saw come out recently 
is link time optimization. Um, and uh, it'd be nice to see this show up in mainline soon. I have, I have a couple of slides I'll talk about that. I actually had a demo at ELC showing, showing LTO uh, running on a real board, an ARM board. Uh, but other than just plain size, you see in, up in user space, you see um, a lot of work on what I call cooperative memory relinquishment. And what that means is it means systems where the processes up in user space are, are communicating with each other or somehow uh, voluntarily giving up memory when it's needed. Um, and I think this is really important uh, when you get uh, out of memory conditions. Um, the applications are now starting to be written in a way that they, um, <coughs> that they cooperate with the kernel and with other processes in uh, returning system to the memory or freeing, freeing memory. So the, the big one that's uh, actually ongoing in the kernel right now that people are working on is volatile ranges. It's not in the kernel yet, but there's a lot of work and the patches I think are pretty close to getting in. Uh, and I'll talk about that. The other one is uh, at, that I saw at ELC 2013. I hadn't seen this before, but uh, it was by Lexmark, which is a uh, printer uh, company in the U.S. Uh, they had uh, something called Membroker and ANR Malloc, which was a, uh, a GLibc Malloc replacement that handled some, uh, some interesting uh, memory issues. Uh, so there's a really good talk on the Lexmark work and uh, some of the stuff there that was done at ELC 2013. Those slides are online. Um, so other things. So uh, in terms of just the footprint of some of the, the, the uh, major components of the system, we saw uh, Jim Huang of uh, OX Lab uh, introduced uh, OLIDC, which is basically a, a bionic, uh, it's it's a, a derivative of Bionic that came from, from Android, but it's actually smaller and more configurable than glibc. So if you look at the numbers there, you can see glibc comes in at about 1.2 meg, and uh, with uclibc, you can, you can get that down to about four and a half or four and a quarter meg. Uh, but Bionic um, is quite a bit smaller than that, or it can be uh, when it's configured quite small. It can be 250K. And uh, he also talked, uh, Jim Hong had a great presentation, talked about uh, not just this OLIBC, but several other things from Android that uh, would be good for us to uh, see if we can integrate into uh, our embedded uh, products and embedded designs. Um, and so this uh, Bionic LibC, he did a lot of work to, uh, to make it usable uh, in non-Android systems. The other thing that we're seeing is configurability, um, at least for eglibc. Uh, so uh, there's a project to add uh, kconfig, uh, or the ability to actually go in and manually select uh, different configuration options for eglibc. And you can see by using some of the features of, of uh, kconfig and the config options, you can reduce the footprint of uh, glibc uh, and the linker and the math library uh, pretty pretty well. So that's a, a kind of pretty big savings. Now I don't know exactly what parts of the system uh, Kim uh, omitted, so I don't know if there's a significant functionality missing, but it does show that it's uh, quite configurable, a lot, lot more configurable. So I think that's good. I think for system size reasons, it, uh, it's really good to have uh, very fine grained configurability. And uh, so this is more stuff that helps people tune their systems for system size. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about LTO, mainly because this is what I've been working on. <laughs> so this is probably uh, the amount of attention I'm giving it is way out of proportion to how interesting it is to other people. But uh, this is a system that was uh, Kind of, there's a, a new feature of GCC that supports extra metadata, um, saves extra metadata at compile time, and then at link time, when all of the uh, compilation units, all the .os are brought to, back together, uh, the linker can do whole program optimization. It can build the call graph 
and uh, it has um, optimization information for the entire kernel at one time. And so it, it does much better at things like constant propagation and uh, dead code removal. And so Andy Clean had uh, has created uh, about 74 patches that add the support to the, the Linux kernel. Uh, this is a slide that I showed, or not a slide, this is this was my poster that I had at the actual ELC technical showcase. Um, I had the world's most boring, I mean thrilling demo, uh, and what I was showing was uh, actually I had an LTO kernel running on uh, Panda board, um, and so, and I, to my knowledge, well, it has done, um, an LTO kernel on ARM, uh, but uh, I was able to get that running short on prints. And yeah, I had a 6% reduction in image size on ARM. The link, final link step is quite long. It takes about a minute and a half to do the final link uh, because of all the extra optimization. There's about 26 optimization passes that happen. Um, so there's longer kernel build times, and it uses a lot of memory, or can use a lot of memory. Uh, and there may be some subtle bugs. So this is something that's a brand new feature of the code of the, uh, for the kernel. And it's not mainline yet. But the benefits is that you get a pretty good size reduction, one of the biggest size reductions we've seen in a long time. Um, you know, Linux Tiny, with Linux Tiny, we were down to uh, only being able to get, you know, 2K or 5K savings. So 380K savings from a single compile option is a pretty big deal. Uh, fortunately, I haven't measured the performance yet, um, so we don't know what the impact on performance is. It shouldn't be any worse, and uh, it'd be nice if we could find out it was better. On x86, which is what Andy Clean uh, measured on, he did find that it was between 6 and 18% faster on certain operations but I haven't measured on ARM. And uh, so why am I so excited about this? Well, the big, it, it opens up new possibilities for uh, automatic kernel <coughs> techniques. Uh, I think that's really important for the kernel to come forward. Uh, it, it takes like set of kind of directive. There's a whole new set of options now for, um, or set of optimizations that we can try to, to continue to improve the kernel size. Uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of focus on was volatile ranges. Um, and uh, this allows cooperation between the kernel and the applications. Um, and uh, basically it allows uh, applications to notify the kernel about retellable memory. And then if they want to use that memory, they can re-request it back. And if it hasn't been used, they can they can just use it. It's for things like caches, uh, where it's not uh, critical data. Uh, it's data that could be regenerated if needed, but it's available to the rest of the system if needed. So it's kind of automatic underneath uh, once the kernel has relinquished it, or once the application program has relinquished it to the kernel. Um, okay, so those are kind of the different technology areas. I didn't even touch on some of the other uh, one area I thought about throwing another slide in was uh, security. Uh, there's been a lot of work uh, in security uh, in the Yocto project. Um, the, I think Wind River contributed uh, a layer that allows you to add SE Linux uh, to your embedded project. Uh, SE Linux is still pretty heavyweight. I don't know how many people are going to do that, but it's, but it's interesting because it's just available there in the Yocto project. Um, uh, another and at the uh, with all the features that are going into Linux having to do with namespaces and containers, uh, there's a lot of opportunity and, and control groups. There's a lot of opportunity for uh, much enhanced security that can be used in embedded. The the big problem, of course, is to use that in embedded. Then you have to turn on uh, those features. You have to turn on namespaces or containers or control groups or whatever. And so it's kind of costly for overhead, but I think security is an interesting topic. I, I probably should have put together a slide on it. So next I'd like to focus on the CE workgroup projects. 
that were done over uh, 2012. So we had uh, several that we uh, we did a little bit less than last year. Last year we did quite a few. Uh, well, two, uh, by 2011 we had about uh, ten different projects. This one, this time we only had five or six, and uh, and for various reasons, uh, some of them didn't. Um, well, ma mainly there was a lot of problems with getting contractors lined up, but uh, but let's talk about uh, these. So one of the things we did do that uh, I'm pretty happy with, uh, I've seen the work, but uh, no one else really has yet, uh, and that's our EMC, MMC tuning guide. So there's a lot of features in the Linux kernel for tuning biosystems, and uh, we asked a company, Cogent Embedded, uh, to analyze uh, four different file systems, ext 3 ext 4 uh, ButterFS and F2FS on a variety of block-based flash parts and on some different development boards. And so they have prepared a document and it's, I've seen essentially this almost, they're almost done with the document, but they have a bunch of methods and scripts for file system testing and just a whole lot of data showing different performance of the different file systems. And in particular what they do is they show you what is the effect of uh, kind of how, how can you tune the file systems? What kinds of things have an impact on performance uh, in terms of block sizes and uh, I.O. scheduler choice and things like that? And so hopefully that'll be really useful. It should be published. Uh, I'll send something out to CE Linux dash dev when it's available, and we'll be putting it on the eLinux wiki. Um, so that's a, a good project that is uh, almost finished. The other project, uh, that we did, and this was reported on at ELC uh, 2013, was kernel dynamic memory analysis. Um, and so this was to instrument, uh, there was a new program to, or a method to instrument and collect data on kernel dynamic memory allocations. And uh, so this used the existing KMEM events infrastructure. And uh, there were some patches submitted upstream and there's a new tool for visualization of kernel memory usage. And so there's a wiki page on this, and also there was a talk by Ezekiel Garcia. Uh, it shows you uh, some nice diagrams. Uh, these are some diagrams from kind of earlier. There's, the tool is actually very, very flexible, and I highly recommend that you, uh, that you look at the slides, and uh, the videos are not up yet, but when the videos are available, kind of see the different options for looking at kernel dynamic memory. So it breaks it down by category. And so you can see how much, how much each system is using in each subsystem um, in terms of the memory that's allocated, either statically or dynamically. Um, Excuse me, Tim. Yes. Unfortunately, the slides are not you know, uh, refreshed. Um, we are still uh, sitting on the outline uh, page. Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, which one? The. Oh, you're still sitting on outline. Sure. Okay. Um, well, do you want to. Uh, where, where is it now? Has it changed at all or not? Yeah, maybe I will, I will change to the uh, uh, local. You know, uh, uh, Okay, I will change my personal computer uh, to present your slides. Um, just a okay. Okay, I'll wait. I can tell you the slide number. I put page numbers on this time. Sure. Sorry about that. No, it's a problem of this kind. Yeah. Well, I'm going to... Yeah, uh, just retry it. Oh, just retry it? Yes. Let me see. Uh, so, is it showing page 28? This is done. Say done. Okay. Yeah, it's probably good to have me look at the screen though. Sure. That way I can see what's going on. <laughs> hmm. Why don't we just
just have you, uh, oh, wait, wait, I'm doing something. <clears throat> yeah, why don't you just show the, uh, the slides? Sometimes. 
The next one, KXEC boot. Um, this was to make some improvements to the KXEC bootloader, uh, things like supporting load from network and also improving the UI. Uh, this work has been going on and uh, kind of slowly, but it should be done in May. Uh, so people who want are, are using kind of, this is a KXEC boot is a graphical front end to using the kernel as its own bootloader, using, doing KXEC to, to load the kernel. So this is a, uh, Kind of nice uh, alternative to things like you boot. Uh, next slide. And then the other thing we really wanted to do, and this relates to a slide I had earlier, is we really want to measure uh, system D and UDEV. Uh, these are getting used in embedded systems, uh, but we think that they have a lot of overhead, um, and uh, particularly in size, and so. We had a contractor lined up for this, but uh, they became unavailable, and so we're considering just restarting this project for 2013. Um, uh, next slide. So the other kind of projects I just want to talk about, I know, I think there's a presentation later today uh, about LTSI, and so I'm not going to talk a whole bunch about it, and I hope I'm not, uh, or not presenting material you're going to see later. Uh, but I also want to just talk about the hardware fund. Um, so next slide, the LTSI. So the LTSI 3.4 kernel is available now. It's been out for uh, a while now. I don't know how long, maybe a month or two. Um, there are lots of presentations available on this, uh, Minakata-san and Shibata-san. And uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, uh, Minakata-san is going to talk later uh, about the status today. So, uh, and there's a, there's this program that you can get free hardware uh, if you are willing to do some LTSI kernel testing. So I hope Mutakana-san tells you about that. I uh, uh, did not plan to tell you about that, but uh, that's, that is actually kind of a, a fun little project to, to get people involved in, in using this. Um, next slide. With that, I kind of wanted to talk about hardware. Uh, just in general. So the CE work group uh, used to have a uh, hardware program where we would buy embedded development boards uh, for developers or, or other embedded hardware. And it, uh, that's because it used to be pretty expensive. Uh, I can remember, uh, I think at one time we paid like $10,000 for a, a development board. Uh, but uh, Boards these days are very inexpensive. Uh, there are lots of under $200 uh, dev boards. Um, and you have to give a lot of credit to um, the TI with their Beagle board, who kind of uh, pioneered this effort. Uh, but uh, just at uh, the Embedded Linux conference, uh, Intel announced uh, an inexpensive uh, development board for the Atom. Uh, and I think it was under 200. It's called the Minnow board. Uh, it, I believe it's under 200. And so, so, uh, and it's pretty common these days to see boards that are, that are pretty inexpensive. So a lot of people can play with them. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, of course, is only $35. Uh, the, there's, uh, the, the Beagle Bone, which is a, a nice hobbyist boy, board, uh, was $79, but there's a new Beagle Bone coming. Uh, that is supposedly even less expensive. And I actually heard a price, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say what the new price will be. But it's going to be uh, less expensive than 79. Uh, and then the other thing having to do with hardware is lots of people have mobile phones or tablets. So all, a lot of people are already carrying around devices that they could do uh, kind of embedded Linux projects with. Um, and so uh, we've kind of stopped the CE Workgroup hardware program. Uh, but uh, it, I think it's a, a great time uh, if you're just getting into embedded Linux or if you want to experiment on the side. Uh, there's lots of opportunity. Hardware is very cheap. And there's actually um, a brand new um, site called code.org uh, that talks, uh, talks about teaching programming skills to, um, to anyone. So anyone can go there, and they have links to several different sites, uh, Khan Academy, and uh, uh, what's the one? 
co a code academy also, but that you can learn JavaScript, you can learn uh, Python or Ruby, and so there's a lot of resources now for people who are just getting started uh, learning embedded Linux or and just uh, programming in in general. So next slide. So last the last area I want to talk about is just kind of other stuff. I'll talk about some of the tools, uh, build systems, uh, the events, and just some miscellaneous notes. So first, let's go to tools. So a couple of, these are actually all based on presentations I saw at ELC. One tool I saw that was really neat uh, was called Cortex, and this is a core dump filter. Um, it was done by Tristan Lelong. Um, and uh, basically, you know, it's it's uh, fairly standard. Well, everybody knows, uh, hopefully, most people know how to make a core file, but we don't use them as embedded because the core files are too big. There's no place to store them. Uh, but uh, Tristan has written uh, a core dump filter program, and uh, it's pretty neat because uh, you can take either an existing core dump file uh, just as a file and filter it through his, this Cortex program of his, or you can actually install this as a core dump handler uh, on a running system. And instead of uh, instead of a core dump that's uh, 18 megabytes, uh, you end, after you filter it, it still is an ELF format and it's still usable with GDB, but it's only on the order of uh, 20 or 30K, which is, which is really useful. Now there is some information loss, but uh, that's really useful for embedded uh, systems where you just don't have the space to store uh, these debug dumps of, of your program. Uh, there were two sections, uh, one on debugging techniques, um, and it was uh, a lot of material that uh, we're pretty familiar with, but a very good overview and, uh, and by Kevin Dankward, and it was the survey of Linux kernel debugging techniques. And then also there was a really good bot on testing frameworks, different different uh, kernel testing tools and techniques. Uh, it was done by Matt Porter. Both of these guys are really experienced and had some had some good information. Um, in the area of build systems, it's kind of down to uh, the public ones are kind of down to the Opto project uh, slash Open Embedded. And there were lots of talks at ELC uh, by. Uh, well, Cohen, I should have put Cohen Coy's talk on here as well. Uh, he had a talk on uh, Open Embedded, um, and uh, Sean Hudson and Saul Wald had some really good material on uh, the Octo Project, kind of the current status. Uh, one thing about the Octo Project, it is a project that is, uh, it's got a, kind of a steep learning curve, uh, but they are working pretty hard to get material out there to improve the documentation and to get uh, tutorial material so it's uh, easier to kind of get into and understand what's going on. Uh, but there are also still people using BuildRoot. BuildRoot is still hanging in there. Uh, so there was one of the demos at the showcase at ELC had uh, some BuildRoot uh, people talking about their stuff. Um, and then finally, um, there was a discussion at Android Builder Summit about uh, using Android uh, for a lot of embedded projects, and uh, in certain cases that makes sense. In fact, you can even use Android headless. Uh, in that case, you're just using some of the lower level pieces of the stack, um, and uh, so not using. You might not even be using Dalvik, but you might be using their init system and their debugger demons and and Bionic and, and all that, um, and of course their build system. So. So there's several ways now to, to build embedded Linux systems, and um, there's lots of lots of choice uh, for people who want to get started. Uh, next slide. So um, our events that are coming up this year, uh, you can kind of see there. Um, we just had embedded uh, Linux conference and Android Builder Summit in February, and uh, if you uh, couldn't attend, hopefully you can uh, leverage the material. Uh, we're still in the process of collecting slides. We have a lot of them collected on the eLinux wiki, and uh, there will be videos posted uh, as well. Uh, Free Electrons uh, recorded the videos, so those should go up soon. 
The next kind of big event on my schedule coming up is LinuxCon Japan. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I always enjoy coming to Japan. That will be in May. Um, and then uh, ongoing Japan jamborees like this one. LinuxCon in the U.S. is uh, in September in New Orleans. Uh, and then Embedded Linux Conference Europe uh, will be in Edinburgh, Scotland in October. Uh, and we're pretty excited about that. And then uh, I do actually know where Embedded Linux Conference. It's going to be in April. I don't have the exact date. But I know it's been pushed to April, and it'll be in San Jose, so a little bit different next year. Um, so it won't be quite as close together as with uh, ELC Europe as last time. It was pretty hard to, to get stuff ready in the short time window we had between ELC Europe and, and ELC, but uh, next year it'll be better. So those are some events to come to if you want to learn some of this stuff firsthand. Um, next thing is the eLinux Wiki. Of course, we continue to put new material on there, um, and I encourage everybody to go out and use the site as well as edit the site. A couple of new projects we're uh, trying out, the video transcription project. So if you're interested in helping us, uh, we're, we're, we want to try and transcribe the videos. There's a lot of videos that have been recorded and are either on the Linux Foundation site or on the Free Electron site, and in some cases even other sites. Uh, it'd be nice to get uh, actual written text for those videos, and so we've started kind of a project that has a template that helps you do that and distribute out the work. And then also we try something new at the conference called Tech Zones. So if you are at a conference and you just want to, and you have a conversation with someone, this is a page that allows you to record that conversation so that other people can kind of chime in. It's a little bit like. Um, well, it's, it's kind of a cross between a blog and uh, and, uh, and, and either e there's a there's another thing called an etherpad, where people kind of collectively take notes together. But uh, we're going to continue to work on those as we go forward. And then the last one, uh, this is just an article I saw that I thought was interesting. The art, the URL at the bottom has the article. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me stop. Okay. Hi. Just a sec. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um. So. Uh, my train of thought. Let's see. Oh, this was an article on has the use of open source license peaked? And someone actually went out and um, started looking at uh, licenses as they're being used and has noticed that um, uh, more and more projects are using, are either, or they're either not using a license at all, which is actually a bit of a problem, or are going with more permissive licenses than the GPL. And so it's kind of an interesting essay. Um, and uh, it actually makes the case that uh, uh, maybe we should start using, uh, you know, Apache and BSD in public domain. And uh, the argument is that individuals and companies <coughs> seem to understand the value of cooperating, even if, uh, even if they. Uh, Even if the license does not require it, um, and so uh, this is uh, this is something I think is interesting. Uh, it could be that GPL is on its way out as a license, and I don't think uh, I don't think uh, I want to say that that it definitely is out, but it was it raised some interesting questions, and it talked about how the the article talked about how uh, people now understand the issues, and uh, it's not always the license that's that's um, com that, that's convincing them to contribute upstream. So that was kind of interesting. Okay, uh, 
So the last slide, just some pointers to some resources. Uh, are kind of the standard places. I get a lot of stuff from LWN.net, uh, from Kernel Newbies, uh, and the eLinux Wiki. Especially, uh, I've mentioned a lot of talks and slides. Uh, if you go to eLinux.org slash events, uh, you can get links to the slides. Again, we're still in the process of collecting slides for the last conference. Also, you might see some stuff on the CELINX dev mailing list, uh, but uh, there's a lot of great material out there, um, and uh, this is where I get my stuff from. Anyway, are there any questions? Uh, I guess next slide. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, let, me, let me know if you have any questions or, or comments. Yes, I have a question. I uh, uh, would like to you to update the latest status about the C Linux forum or the wiki page yeah, to recover. Oh, yeah, I don't. I I did not hear back yet. Sure. So I sent something to the um, uh, administrator uh, that is now being administered by the Linux Foundation. And I'm not sure what happened to it. I think it may have been the permissions. Uh, it may be a permissions problem because they were working on um, integrating it with the Linux Foundation accounts. Yeah. But they were not. The, the 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 private wiki does do that. If you have a Linux Foundation account, mm -hmm. uh, you can access the private, and it's registered in the CE work group. You can access the private wiki. But the public wiki should not have had any uh, access controls on it. So I think that's what the problem is. But I haven't heard back yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Or comments? Or anything? Thank you. 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 Something uh, the new trend will make some uh, difficulties. Uh, maybe we would like to look into some something about more about the sky. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, have a very good day. Thank you very much, and see you. Thank okay. You.